What up? City First Church. We are so glad that you are here. Today's message, I believe, is going to add value to your life and to your relationships. I don't know where you are on your journey with God or your journey in life. I don't know if you're a Christian, maybe you're thinking about being one, but I believe that today's message is going to change how you see yourself, how you see other people, and perhaps even how you see God. Today's message is called How to Deal with Complicated People, okay? How to deal with complicated people. Don't look at your neighbor when I give the title of the message, okay? I saw someone like, yeah, it's about to go down today. No, 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 no. Right front and center, okay? I need your eyes, okay? Eyes up here, okay? Because if there is one thing you can guarantee in life, it's that you will have to deal with people who are complicated. You can't run from them. You can't hide from them. They are everywhere. They complicate everything. One of the things that people complicate is, is church. Why? Because Democrats and Republicans both go here and serve in the children's ministry together. And when they want to fight, I'm like, y'all need to take this outside, okay? Don't do this in front of these kids, okay? How in the world do they volunteer at the same time? I don't know. It's complicated, okay? People, they also make diversity complicated. Why? Because black and white people are both complicated. So are Mexicans, Asians, big people. They are complicated, okay? And I love when churches and companies are like, we want to be more diverse. I'm like, are you sure you want to be more diverse? Because it's only going to make things more complicated. You want to know what people, specifically younger ones, make complicated? Parenting. <laughs> Parenting is complicated. You ever had your kid test your patience in public and you want to cuss them out, but you can't because it's complicated. You were raised in the 90s before parents were arrested for domestic abuse. <laughs> parents used to just pull over on the side of the road and grab a branch off a tree, take care of business. You could be driving down the street and you had to see a parent on the side of the road, you'd just be like, I know what's happening over there. I know what's happening. I know what's happening. You didn't call the police. You didn't call the FBI. No, no, there was nobody to call. You, you was just, whoever was in that minivan, was, it, you knew that that mom said, don't make me get, go back there. And she pulled over and handled business on the spot, okay? I don't know if you remember back in the day, you, the principal could whoop your behind at school. <laughs> By law, this, this was the thing. And the principal could call your parents to get off work to come whoop your behind at school and have to go back to work. And it was embarrassing because they'd have to take a 45-minute break and then they have to come back and tell their coworkers where they've been. Oh, Johnny was acting a fool at school and I had to go handle business. So the principal called. Like that was the thing. So when your kids act a fool in public, you want to deal with them like it's 1999, but you can't <laughs> because it's complicated. People make social media complicated. You ever logged in? It's interesting. The range of emotions you can experience in just two minutes. The, you, your first post, you'd be like, oh, man, my friend posted some avocado toast. That's cool. <laughs> like. Next scroll. Co-worker posts a picture of their kids playing at a park. You're like, you know, I ain't taking my kids to the park in a while. You know, maybe I should take my kids to the park. Cool. Like. One more scroll. Your friend's in Cabo. You're like, my life is terrible. Okay? Just like that. <laughs> You're like, whoa, how did that happen? That was a swing in just 20 seconds. One more swipe. Now you got to add for new clothes. Now you're like, I ain't got nothing to wear. You ain't got nothing to wear now, huh? Now, you're not, now your closet just, just went empty on you, okay? Then all of a sudden your friend get political on another post. Now you're angry, okay? One more scroll. Your friend posts a before and after photo. They lost 40 pounds. You gained the COVID-19 pounds. Now you're like, you're flooded with inadequacy, insecurity, envy, anger. Anybody ever deleted social media and re-downloaded it in the same week a few times? You just kind of go back and forth with this thing. And listen, someone from the outside might say that that's psychotic. You would simply say, it's complicated. People make work complicated. Anybody work with compl some complicated people? Why is it complicated? Because people be late. They be lying. They lazy. They be stealing stuff. Uh, whenever I, I get an opportunity to work with teams and leaders, it's interesting. The leader thinks their team isn't working all that hard. <laughs> and the team thinks their leader isn't working all that hard. 
both of them could sit in their offices and think to the other, what do you even do all week? And I just laugh because I think what you both don't know about each other is it's complicated. Uh, people make love complicated. Dating online or offline complicated and getting more and more complicated by the week. When my single friends try to explain to me online dating, because uh, I have I dated since 2008. I've been married for a while now. Um, I feel like they're speaking Hebrew a little bit. I don't, I don't even know the language no more. Homie the other day said, hey, uh, I'm Frecklin. I said, Frecklin? What is Frecklin? Frecklin is, is when someone is only interested in a relationship during the warm summer months. I said, you can't date nobody grown fre Frecklin around, okay? Like, I don't know. He said, you're old. It's complicated. I said, no, you need a job. That's what you need to do, okay? You need to grow up. I don't know why you Frecklin around. You need to get it together. Marriage? Complicated. Uh, my marriage has its, most of its complications around retrieving coffee from my wife. Um, whenever my wife sends me on a coffee errand, this is all I ask of her. I said, Bay, will you send me a text message of exactly what you want and I will read it to the barista so I cannot mess this up, okay? She sends me the text message. I get to, to the drive-thru. I'm thinking, this is great. I'm a great husband. I can't, it, it is foolproof. How could I possibly get it wrong? I read it off for the barista. And then the barista asks me a question that I feel like is a life or death question. <laughs> he says, hot or cold? I go, what? What'd you say? Hot or cold? <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean to tell me this drink could be hot or cold? Bro, my life is on the line. What do you mean, hot or cold? Can you, can I do kids temp where it's kind of cold and kind of warm? I don't know. So I call my wife like, all right, I just, I, she'll just tell me if she want a hot or cold. She don't answer the phone. She hopped in the shower. Okay, now what we going to do? People honking behind me, sir, I said hot or cold. Hey, let me get both, play. I need hot and cold. I'm a veteran. I'm a veteran, play. I need both. He goes, you want two drinks, hot and cold? Yep, I don't know what we're doing today, but, but, but listen, I ain't losing today. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> Dave Ramsey would be very disappointed in our monthly coffee budget, but I would say, bro, it's complicated. Uh, there is no uh, version of your life where you won't be dealing with complicated people. There is no version of your holidays that, where you won't be dealing with complicated people. There is no version of, of having in-laws where you won't deal with complicated people, okay? You might think your mother-in-law is complicated, and you tell your friends, man, my mother-in-law is complicated, but your mother-in-law tells her friends that you are complicated, okay? So there is no version that in our life where we won't deal with complicated people. We just, know, we just need to know how to actually deal with them. I mean, what in the world are we supposed to do when we're consistently surrounded by all these people who keep making our life more and more complicated. Here's what would be ideal, is if we could go to a website, perfectpeople.com, and just hire them, work with them, date them, marry them. The only problem is we wouldn't be on the website. Because what I know about you, what I know about me, is that we are complicated. I am complicated. And so are you. And any time we start having a discussion about self-awareness, we're always hoping somebody else is listening. Like right now, you're thinking, man, I can't wait for somebody else to hear this message. It's going to be good. Like in your mind, when I began going through the list of things that people make complicated, you immediately began thinking about your boss, your brother, your sister, your spouse, your colleague, your neighbor, your teacher. And you were thinking, today's going to be good because he's going to deal with them. <laughs> And I know it's unavoidable that we all live with, work with, date, marry, lead, and raise kids with complicated people. The irony is this, is that we are somebody else's complicated person. Would you believe me if I told you that there's somebody in your life that needs to go to counseling to deal with you? You'd be like, no, I ain't that bad. Are you sure? Tell that to the therapist. I mean, most of us live with the mantra of, of, of this, right? If they would just, if they would just get their act together. 
If my manager would just, if my colleagues would just, if my spouse would just, if my kids would just, if, if our neighbors would just, if the church would just, if the government would just, if the bears would just, <laughs> if the Packers would just, if, I mean, we just, if the, if the state of Florida would just, I mean, if everyone would just get their act together, the world would be a better place. If everyone else would just change, my life would be better. But people who follow Jesus shouldn't think that way. People who follow Jesus should think the world would be a better place if I changed. The world would be a better place if I did something different. Do you want to know what the common denominator is of every complicated person we have ever had tension with is? Us. <laughs> At some point, we got to do the math. You want to know what the math is? If, if everyone in your family, if everyone at your job, if everyone at your school it has to deal with their issues, if they are the problem, well, guess what? If everyone is the problem in that equation, we might be the problem. I was catching up with a friend at lunch the other day. I just kept bringing up some different mutual friends. Man, this person's doing well. And every time I'd bring up a person, Man, they would just speak negatively about them. So I kept switching people. I'm thinking, well, let's find somebody you like, okay? And so by, by about the fifth person, he got to this place where he's just going, and, and he, he caught it. I didn't have to say it. He goes, Ryan, I, I guess I've got to gripe with everybody, don't I? I said, I don't know. I'm just wondering if you have one with me. <laughs> and what we all did to get on your frustrated list and so at some point, I think we got to look in the mirror. So how do we deal with complicated people? Well, number one, I think we have to realize our own complications. We have to realize our own complications. I love it. Romans 3 verse 23 says, it says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Can we all just say that together? I just want us to do it. Just, just there, I think this would be just group therapy for us. Okay, let's all say this together. We all fall short. Now, I think we wish that, it, that the verse said they all. Like, they all fall short around me, and I got to endure it and deal with it, and I'm constantly putting up with their stuff. But, guys, we're, we're all in this complicated boat together. There is no complicated boat that we're not sitting in. Because it's easy to live with the sense that whoever is dating us, Whoever is loving us, raising us, leading us, or working with us is, well, they're getting the better end of the stick. <laughs> it's easy to live with the sense that everyone else is getting a good deal when they get us. And here's the, I'm, all, I'm all for walking, walking in confidence, but confidence needs to come from reality. And the reality is that story is most likely fiction. In light of the relationship you want to have personally and professionally, it's better for you to err on the side of saying, I'm a little complicated, and I've got some things to work on. Now, this is very difficult to do for leaders, leaders in business, leaders in homes. This is very hard for breadwinners because of your position and what you bring to the table and what you've provided for other people, you can feel entitled. Sometimes money can make someone believe it gives them the right to be rude. I'm paying you, aren't I? I gave you a job. I gave you a house. I, I bought you a car. As if that somehow makes you perfect. It might make you generous. But let's be clear, it does not give you a get out of my own complications free car. In fact, it don't make you less complicated. It might make you more complicated. Mo money, mo complications. <laughs> and so at some point, you and I have to go, before I get on everybody else's case, before I deal with other complicated people, I have to realize that somebody just might be having to deal with me. So I am a complicated person. The second thing that I think is very important in dealing with complicated people is I think we should ask ourselves what God does with our complications. Then copy and paste. How does God deal with us? How does God deal with People from the beginning of time. This is why I love the Bible. This is why I love Scripture, because I love watching who God chooses to make a difference in the world. By the way, the missions that God sent men and women on in Scripture, we would never pick these people in a million years. Okay, we, we would never choose the weakest to defeat the strongest. Like, but that's, 
That's often what God does. Think about Abraham. God wants him, to, him and his wife to have children. But they owe, I'm talking real old, 90 and 100 to be exact, okay? Oh, oh. But God's like, I, I want you to have children. But, but we owe God. It's complicated. God didn't care. He used them anyway. Moses, God wants him to go to a vitriolic maniac leader to liberate God's people. But Moses has a speech impediment. Oh, and there's a warrant out for his arrest. He's an ex-murderer, or actually a current murderer, okay? And so, hey, God, it's a little complicated. God didn't care. He used him anyway. David, giant killer, a man after God's own heart. That's how he's described in Scripture. Israel's favorite king. If David could get credit for the songs he's co-written in today's day and age, he'd have to have a closet for his Grammys. However, he's also an adulterer and murderer and a mediocre father. How can a man so talented be so complicated? Despite his flaws, God still used him anyway. Peter, the oldest of the disciples, the only other man in human history to walk on water besides Jesus Christ himself. He is in the inner circle of Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen. But he's got anger issues. When the soldiers stepped to Jesus to arrest him before crucifixion, Peter pulled out a dagger and sliced a man's ear off. Okay, Peter said, I follow Jesus, but will still cut you. It's complicated. <laughs> and after betraying Jesus, when Jesus comes back, he could have he put pressure on him. He, he, he could have come... Peter, hey, Peter, why, why'd you deny me? Why, why'd you pretend like you had never known me? Peter could argue Jesus. It was complicated. They might have crucified me too. But Jesus didn't put that pressure on him. Resurrected Jesus. Found him on a beach. And said, I'm not done with your life yet. Now let's get the band back together and go build the church. The Apostle Paul. It don't get more complicated than this, man. He was a Christian terrorist. He was sanctioned by the government to hunt and execute Christians. And I just want you to imagine when he showed up for the first church service as a Christian. People were scared to death. In fact, it's actually recorded in Scripture. And, and, and he, he, when he got there, everyone was scared. And he says, guys, I know it's complicated. I got knocked off a horse, and now I'm on your team. Imagine bringing him over for dinner after church, okay? Honey, we're home. Whoa, whoa, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, no. Yet God decided to use him. Anyways, how does God deal with our complications? He sees them. He forgives them. Uses us anyways. And loves us as if we had no complications in the first place. I love what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. He says, tolerate the weaknesses of those in the family of faith. Forgiving one another in the same way you have been graciously forgiven by Jesus Christ. If you find complications in somebody else, if you find fault with someone, release the same gift of forgiveness to them. Give them a little bit of margin for error. What should we do with all these complicated people that we're stuck with? I think we should tolerate their weaknesses. Not because we are amazing and they aren't. No, it, it's because every single one of us has something about us that someone in our life is tolerating. Anytime you read Colossians 3.13, you think of somebody. Well, guess what? There's somebody in your world who reads Colossians 3.13 and thinks of me, and they think of you. I was talking to I was talking to a friend, and, and we were kind of going back and forth about some, some people that used to be on his team, and, and he used a phrase that, that you probably have heard a lot that just, it really troubles me. I said, hey, how's, how's so-and-so doing? He said, I don't know. They're dead to me. I said, dead to you? They died? What did they do? 
that would cause you to, I don't know, cerebrally murder them? And what it is, is it's a part of a cancel culture that says, hey, if, if you don't agree with me, or if you say something that I find offensive, well then, I can just erase you out of my life. We can, we can, we can just be done. And so what cancel culture does is it gives us some very, very interesting math, okay? And here's, here's the interesting math that cancel culture gives us. It's this. It's they hurt me equals I get to cancel them. However, uh, if I hurt them, we think, well, give me a break. I had COVID. I lost a family member. I was going through a lot. My kids were wilding out. I, I, I got sued. My company restructured. I was depressed. I had a lot of pressure. So we want other people to give us the benefit of the doubt for our very complicated behind the scenes that they're completely unaware of. But we'll give them an emotional funeral for them and our hearts for their behavior. And maybe that's okay for regular people. But I'd argue it's not okay for Christian people. You and I should make space for other people's complications. And pray that they're doing the same for us. I know some people think, I'll do it if everybody does it. But I don't want to be the only one that's forgiven. I don't want to be the only one that's given grace. Nobody's giving me a break. My parents never gave me one. My coach never gave me one. My boss never gives me one. My family never gives me one. And you do, I get that. But are you really going to let someone else's behavior dictate yours? Even if they never change, it doesn't mean you can't. If everybody else does it, you'll do it. Well, what if they need to see what it looks like before they can? What if they need to see it modeled? Well, in that case, thank God they got you. Thank God they live with you. Thank God they work with you. Thank God they married you. Thank God they're being raised by you. If you're a Christian or you want to be one, it's an invitation to be different. So let's be different, ladies and gentlemen. Even if they never change, it doesn't mean you can't. Look at how God treats us in all that is complicated with us. And then I think we should copy and paste it into our relationships. Not because they deserve it, but because you didn't deserve it. Number three, on how to deal with complicated people. Give them realistic expectations. Give them realistic expectations. I love what John 16, says. It says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I think Jesus is genius. He's going, hey, ladies and gentlemen, I know you're a Christian. I know, I know it's, it's great. It's eternity. It's awesome. By the way, in this world, you will have trouble. Some of us are just so shocked by trouble. <laughs> Trouble's coming. What? Whoa. Jesus is like, didn't I tell you it was coming? Spoiler alert. Trouble is on its way. Trouble is on its way in the form of a person at your job, maybe a person in your home. And remember, we might be somebody's person. So part of the reason that we get frustrated with other complicated people is because we keep letting them take us by surprise. <laughs> And, and part of the reason we keep getting frustrated is because we have these unmet, unspoken, and unrealistic expectations. And so I think one of the ways to deal with other complicated people is to expect there to be complicated people. Stop being shocked. I mean, it's just so funny to me. People, these people that keep frustrating you, these complicated people that you're having to endure. These, this is the phrase I hear people, people say, I can't believe they posted that. Can't believe it. We can't believe it. We shot. We are genuinely surprised. I can't believe they said that. I can't believe he forgot to take out the trash. How could he? I can't believe it. I can't believe. We, we're shocked that they're selfish. We can't believe. We can't believe. We can't believe. My friends, start believing. Start believing. You're letting who they are take you off guard and ruin your day. Why? Why would you give somebody that much power? Stop giving away other people your joy. We surrender for the smallest of offenses. I know people who have allowed the enemy to rob them of years of joy because of what one pastor said to them. One. 
And here's the deal. What they said, I think, was totally wrong. I just think it's equally wrong to give one person that much power in your life. A pastor is a guide, not a god. And there's a big difference. Hey, I'm going to try and steer you this way and say, hey, here's how you get to God. But the minute you make that person a God, you've missed the mark. So, of course, they're going to disappoint you. You may have heard me say this a lot, and I won't stop. People make great mates, but horrible gods. They make great companions, but they are horrible saviors. And the minute we give expectations to another man or woman to make us happy, we will be disappointed every single time. They're amazing. They're just not that amazing. So here's something I want you to consider this week. Maybe you should write this down. Okay, look, what are my actual expectations of other people? What are my actual expectations of other people and why? Where do they come from? Are they realistic? Here's a good one. Are they aware of them? Because some of us wake up with the expectation that other people need to be perfect. We just never told them. And so they keep disappointing us each and every day, and we keep getting mad. And they're going, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know I was on trial. Am I on trial right now? I didn't know, I didn't know, no one told me. And so at some point, we got to pause and go, where are these expectations coming from? Are they realistic? Are we talking about a God or a neighbor? Are we talking about a God or a coworker? And then you got to start asking, well, what are my expectations of myself and why? And where did those come from? I mean, and do, do the people in my world know I'm being incredibly hard on myself? Because if the people in your world knew how hard you were on yourself, they would say, why are you forcing yourself to do all this stuff? Why do you think you need to look a certain way? Why aren't you eating? Why, why are you putting yourself through all of this to impress what? For a few... If the people in your world knew exactly how hard you were on you, they would tell you, you should give yourself a break. We don't need you to be that to be in our friendship yeah. circle. We, we, we don't need you to go broke trying to stay in our little club. We don't need you to do that. And, and here's a better question. What are my expectations for God? Because what I found is that we have more expectations for humans than we do God, yet God can actually handle our expectations and our humans cannot. And so you want to start thinking, okay, do I have expectations for God? And do they re- actually require faith for me to go, man, God, I actually, I actually kind of want to get my hopes up and believe that you can turn some things around in my life because he can. But I got to ask you today, does God ever hear from you about those expectations? Because it's easy for us to just kind of walk around, have expectations for God and never talk to God about them but can easily walk around and be disappointed if he doesn't meet our demands. So at some point, I think the way we deal with complicated people is we prepare for complicated people. (laughs) Don't let them surprise you. They're coming. Trouble is on the way. Jesus already told you, okay? So today's a Sunday. So tomorrow, Monday morning, don't let anybody shock you, okay? You need to walk in going, you're going to be complicated today. You're going to be complicated today. You're going to be complicated today. And then stop in the bathroom and look in the mirror and go, you're going to be complicated today. (laughs) Prepare for it. But don't let anyone take your entire day because God made it. And he has a purpose for it. Now, this last thing on how we deal with complicated people is going to absolutely blow your mind. You've never heard this before in your life. It's going to change your life if you do it. It's mind-blowing. And and I can't take credit for it. It's all Jesus. Remember, he's a genius on how to deal with complicated people. The last thing that I want to encourage you to do to deal with complicated people is number four. Pray for them. Pray for them. You're like, what? That's it? You ain't never did it, so... Yeah, pray. Pray for them. Um, And here's how Jesus says it. In in Matthew 5, he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. In other words, uh, Jewish rabbis actually used to teach in synagogues. Say, come on, gather around, gather around, gather around, gather around, gather around, gather around, gather around. Uh, Your neighbors, love them. Enemies, hate them. In fact, it is your duty by God to hate your enemies. And everybody in the synagogue go, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
All of a sudden, Jesus steps in the synagogue and goes, hey, I know what you guys have been taught, but new rules for a new school. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. To which I would have stood up and said, Jesus, I barely pray for people I like. You want me to add these fools to the list too? <laughs> to which you say, yeah, Ryan, yeah. And, and here's why. Here's why it's a better plan. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. He's going, I, I want to help you be more like Dad. Which is a better way to live. I mean, if it, it, do you know how easy it would be for me to stand in the synagogue, Ryan, and tell you to hate your enemy and hold on to bitterness? Hey, guess what? Dad doesn't want you to live like that. So I got a, I, I got, I got a better plan. And guess what? Your enemy, my father makes his son rise. And I just... I, <laughs> It's kind of a little humble brag that Jesus just throws in there. You know what I'm saying? He makes, he didn't say the son. He said he makes his son. Which means, hey, uh, my daddy owns it all, and he ain't tripping about these complicated people, so why are you? By the way, my, my dad controls the weather. So I know we go up and down. It snowed. It rained. It's, but he's going, I control the weather for everybody. So, I know when it rains on the just and the unjust. And so, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Gentile was just a, a phrase in Scripture for people that didn't have a relationship with God. Jesus is going, people without a relationship with God can love those who love them back. You know what my love language is? gifts, specifically shoes, okay? So when somebody speaks my love language, I ain't got no problem loving them back. Hey, yeah, yeah, size 13, yeah, man, come here and give me a hug, man. How you been? You know, that's easy. But for the people that I can find myself distancing myself from, those are complicated people. To which Jesus would go, pray for if there's anybody that's complicated to deal with, it's our enemies. And let's clarify enemy, by the way. The ones Jesus was referring to were people who were trying to kill each other. We refer to enemies as anybody that disagrees with us on social media, okay? Nevertheless, Jesus says, hey, I want you to take this whole love thing to a whole new level. And I just think it's genius. And here's why I think it's genius. It's difficult to consistently hate someone you're consistently praying for. Because you can hold on to bitterness all day long, but as soon as you go, but God, I just thank you for them eventually. You can't hold on to both at the same time. And the more you pray, I think the more you just kind of let go of some of that bitterness. And when I say pray for the complicated people in your life, I'm not saying that you should pray for them to change. Because guess what? They're praying for you to change too. Yeah, Lord, I pray that these Democrats will get their act together. And I pray that these Republicans will get their act together. And sometimes I, I love sitting with married couples that are praying for each other to change, right? And if you're God, that's a very interesting collective prayer that comes to you. Like, okay, he wants you to change and she wants you to change. But if I change both of you at the same time, you're eventually going to ask each other to change back. Okay, and so that's just going to be really interesting. What if you just prayed, God, I just... I pray that they would walk in your will. God, I pray that they would experience everything you have for them. God, I just, God, I, I pray for every relationship that they have, that there would be peace there. And there may not be peace in ours, but I pray that that wouldn't be their, their, the deal with all of their relationships. You do that for the long haul, you find yourself really dealing with complicated people. I, I remember I was talking to a mentor about a complicated person in my life. And I was on the phone, I was just ranting and raving and just venting, and he did this, and he said this, and then, 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 and he just sat there patiently. He asked me a question. He said, Ryan, have you prayed about it? I said, no, I want to cuss about it, okay? That's what I want to do. <laughs> and it's interesting, sometimes if you are a Christian, the assumption is I've already taken this to God, but that's a false assumption. 
<laughs> like, like that, that doesn't make it true. Just because you're a Christian, you think, well, God read my mind this morning. And it, it, no, 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 no. Osmosis is not how we talk to God, okay? No, like sometimes we can just carry this stuff around it without actually giving it to God. And this is what my mentor encouraged me to do. He said, Ryan, why don't you pray for an opportunity to be honest? Why don't you pray for an opportunity to have a healthy, engaged conversation? And that's what I began doing. And six months later, that's exactly what happened. And it wasn't contentious. It was actually beneficial for both of us. And I learned some things. And we got to clear the air on some things. What, but if I would have gone in there guns blazing, because sometimes we can live with this. Oh, I, I, I got a way of dealing with complicated people. Okay, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. How's that working out for you, buddy? Like sometimes we just kind of take these things into our own hands. The guy's going, whoa, 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 whoa. I got a better player. That doesn't involve violence. <laughs> it doesn't involve all of these things that we think are going to help us. No, actually, my way, you might actually walk away with some, some peace. Dare I use the word reconciliation. So, how do we deal with complicated people? Number one, realize our own complications. Number two, ask ourselves, what does God do with our complications? Then copy and paste. Number three, give them realistic expectations. Do not let them surprise you. Number four, why don't you pray for them? Why don't you pray for them? We've tried the bitterness thing. Where has that gotten you lately? What about prayer? I got somebody in my life that I need to be praying for. That sometimes I'm going, if you would have just, they're not going to just do anything. But sometimes praying for them is actually doing more for me than it is them. God, I thank you so much for the opportunity we've had to figure out how in the world to deal with complicated people. God, I pray that in moments where we're frustrated or there's tension, may we remember what you have done for us. And may we copy and paste that to the best of our ability. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. Hey, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give each and every person at every location an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. I can tell you this. Forgiving, letting go is way easier when you have a Savior. Forgiving is much easier when you know you've been forgiven. Letting someone else off the hook is much easier when you know you've been let off the hook. And that's what making Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life does. It's saying, you know what, I, I realize that I've done wrong and somebody else paid for it. His name is Jesus. If today you'd like to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life with no one looking around, would you just slip up your hand and say, hey, Ryan, that's me. Ryan, that's me. I see a couple hands. Is there anybody else? I can see a hand back there. That's great. Hey, can we all say this prayer together? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I ask now that you would be the Lord and the Savior of my life. I surrender my future, my relationships, my decisions, and my complications to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said. Amen. Come on, can we make some noise for every single person that gave their heart to Christ?